Would you have any coffee if I made some? Yes, of course. Is it cold outside? It wasn't too bad. You didn't test to see if the battery worked, did you? I did. Does it work? No, it didn't start. Uh, I'm charging that battery. Oh. So maybe maybe it arrived not fully charged. I don't know. Hopefully it. Hopefully it starts because then it's something else wrong.
Oh, Paul, glad you're here. Did you get your test scores from us, Paul? From your first test? Oh, good. Good, you did a good job. So we're going to start geometry tonight. So you can get out the circle packet, and we'll wait a couple minutes for Patrick. I always appreciate that you're on time. So the practice tests are helpful because you get a real experience and you, you know, we send the scores back pretty quickly and you can go over the ones you missed. And so I'm going to remind both you and Patrick to take test seven whenever you can. So we'll wait a minute more for him. So there's about 10 questions on geometry on the test. It used to be a lot more. And you probably had geometry, I'm assuming, two years ago maybe, in ninth grade. Oh, Paul took test seven. And you are awesome. Oh, nice. Nice, Paul. We'll look forward to it. Did it seem easier? A little bit? Oh, Patrick, you're here too. Okay, so we're going to start so uh, with the circle packet. And so what I'd like you to do first, thank you, mm -hmm. um, is thank you, Paul, for that feedback. We're going to go to a formula page. I'd like you to look, oh, a couple housekeeping things. Let me just go through some things. So uh, why it's on my mind, if you're taking the November 5th test, which I sort of recommend you do, because the next big test would be in March, and um, that's a few months away, so you might as well ride the wave off this class and take this test, but you have to sign up by October 25th. And also, for both of you guys, next Tuesday, I don't know if your school's told you yet, uh, so it's October 11th. It's a Tuesday night from 7 to 9 at Bethel Park High School. There's a college fair. And so... If you want to go, and it, it could be a pretty easy way to pick up college applications. Wait a minute. That's okay, Patrick. That's great. We still have time. No worries. Okay, so Patrick's, Patrick's going to the college fair. Okay, great. We have a, a table there, so you can come and say hi to us, because we don't know what you look like. <laughs> sort of funny so um, like I said it's a I mean it's we live in the present but 
this is a way to sort of catapult you into thinking about the future and um, picking up applications and asking questions of admissions people. So what I'd like to do now is just go in the blue book. So Patrick already knew about this. Page 734. So if you're there, when you pass our table, just say hi so we know what you look like. So on page 734, we're going to look at the formula page that you get on every math section. And so I was telling Paul Patrick that there's about 10 geometry questions. You'll get a couple easy, a couple middle, and a couple hard ones. So we're going to start tonight with circles. It looks like an oval, but anyway, area is pi r squared. They tell you that uh, circumference is 2 pi r, or that can also be pi d. And then later in the down below there, it says there's 360 degrees in a circle or 2 pi radians. So the math lesson isn't too bad tonight, but I like to review it so that you're, when you face a circle, when it pops up on the test, you're all good. So let's go to the packet. And so we're going to start with the first page. Like we always start pretty easy. Okay, so what is the radius? So it's any line segment from the center of the circle to the end. Obviously, this is back in geometry. So a chord connects any two points on the circle and the longest chord you can fill it in will be the diameter. And obviously two radii equal the diameter. Now this was on a test. It's just sort of a fun fact, but it actually appeared on an SAT a little bit ago and that is a line tangent to a circle is perpendicular to the radius at the point of tangency. And so now let's go down to the table. So I'm going to do this first one for you. So whenever you get a circle problem, so you want to ask yourself, I have to get the radius. So, and they always keep things pretty much in terms of pi, about 90%. So let's start with this one. If the radius is 2, the diameter will be 4, the circumference will be 4 pi, and the area will be pi r squared, which is unusual. This is a unique circle. It also is 4 pi. So what I'd like you to do, if the diameter is 6, can you fill in the rest of this chart? I'll give you a couple seconds to go. Don't put your answers in the chat room. I'll go over them and you can monitor yourself at home. You guys are so great at coming in on time. Thank you. Yeah, the, the college fair was halted for two years because of COVID. This is the first time they've had an in-person one since COVID hit. Just let me know, gentlemen, when you're done in the chat room. Just put done in the chat room so I know you're done. So Paul's done. Good, guys. Okay, so if the diameter is 6, the radius will be 3. The circumference will be 6 pi. 
you check your own work and the area is nine pi. I'm just going through this so that it's up in the forefront of your brain for November 5th. If the circumference is 10 pi, the diameter is 10, the radius is five, and so the area would be 25 pi. And so if the area is 16 pi, that means the radius has to be four, diameter eight, and circumference eight pi. So I'm assuming you guys have that. So let's go on to the next page. And this is how you visually see it on the test. So whatever they give you, get the radius. And you only have to use two formulas. And just tell me when you're done in the chat room. Okay, so Paul's done with this page. Well, wait a second for you, Patrick. I know you probably had this two years ago, so. But instead of doing a whole big, thanks Patrick, whole big geometry tome, we have two packets that cover all the geometry. So the circumference is 2 pi r, so that means the diameter is 24. The radius is 12. Just mark your paper, correct or not. The area would be 144 pi. Okay, going to number two. Wow, they gave us the radius. That's a gift. So if the radius is four, the diameter is eight, circumference is eight pi, and the area is 16 pi. Up here, this time they gave us the diameter, so the radius is six, circumference 12 pi, area is 36 pi. And so for number four, what did they give us? They gave us the area so that means the square root of 64. So the radius is eight. Uh, the whole diameter is 16. And the circumference will be 16 pi. So that's just, a, that was just setting the foundation. And so let's go on to some circle problems. So all we're dealing, I had to decide whether to do circles first or triangles first. And since the circle formula was first in the formula page, we put it in the, um, we did this packet first. So if the area is 36 pi, this one's pretty easy. 
and so the radius is 6. Thank you, College Board, for 10 points. Now for number two, this is a harder one, and the harder ones are going to be multi-step. So yes, you'll get a couple easy, couple in the middle, and then there'll be some in the hard zone. So what you have to do is just be a detective and do the first thing you can and then take that'll lead you to the next step. So this is an example. In the figure above, the four circles are the same size and each circle is tangent, means touching, to two sides of the larger square and to two of the other circles. Their centers are the vertices of the smaller square. If the area of the smaller square is 9, so that means each side is 3. Wait, this whole thing is 3. This is 3. So that means the radius is going to be 1 and a half. So we have to get a side because we're our goal is to get the area of the larger square. And like I said, I just want to impart to you the, to empower you that you can fill in what you need to know and then that'll lead you to the next step, which will lead you to the next step. And by the way, your PSAT should be very soon coming out, so maybe next week and uh, it'll seem like a baby test compared to this. So if we know this is 3, the radius is 1.5. How can we get this side? And here's where we have to draw a line. And they don't say draw a line. We just have to figure that out. So if we draw a line, that'll be 1, 2, 3, 4 radii. And so 1.5 times 4 would be 6. 6 times 6, the larger square, is 36. So if 2 is okay, can you gentlemen just let me know in the chat room? I, wanted, I, I would be not a great teacher if I didn't take you into the deep end and try the harder questions. Okay, Paul's okay with it. Patrick, did I go too fast or not? I'm not sure. Because that was a that would be a hard one because you have to make you have to make the connections. And I don't know how many of these problems you did geometry class. Okay, thanks, Patrick. Okay, here's another hard one. And again, it's dealing with triangles. So in the figure below is composed of a semicircle and a right triangle. What is the area of the composite figure? And that means the two figures together. Well, the triangle is easy. The triangle is just one half, the base times the height, which will be two. So we know that uh, the fours are out. And now our hard thing is we have to get half a circle. So that'll be 1 half pi r squared. I need to get the radius, which is tricky. So I can use the Pythagorean theorem, so it'll be 2 squared. And next week, after we do triangles, so that's 8, which is 3, 2. So the whole diameter will be um, two square roots of two. Well, half of that diameter is our radius, so we just divide that by two. I hope you're okay staying with me. And then it'll be, like I said, next week after we do the triangles, they often um, put one, one with another. So the radius is gonna be the square root of two, So that'll cancel, and we will get just pi. So the triangle was 2, half the circle was pi. And so that harder one, and there's a reason for my madness, 
Uh, let me just know if three is okay. I can go over it again. What I'm trying to do is, like I said, empower you to take the steps one at a time. Thanks, Patrick and Paul. Okay, let's go to four. So sometimes you're likely to get a shaded portion of the diagram. And there's no way I can get dimensions on that. So what I'm going to do is get the square minus half a circle. So I'm going to find the area of the square. So the square is two by two. They tell me it's a square. So that area is four. Then I have to do half the circle. That radius will be one. And I'll do pi times one squared. So that'll be four minus one half pi, which if I can change it, and it looks a lot like C. So just let me know if four is okay, and we're gonna go to a harder one. Thanks, Patrick and Paul. Okay, now this one is in the hardest zone. So sometimes we've seen frames where you have to, you know, find a frame. But this time it's, a, it's like a bullseye. So in the figure above, the four circles have the same center. And the radii are, so let's list them, one, two, maybe I'll make this a little bigger. This circle is three and the big circle is four. I'm trying to get the area of the smaller ring to the area of the big ring. So let's start with the big ring. So that would be four squared, which is 16 pi minus this is 3 squared, which should be 9 pi. So the outer, so I'm basically, I'm trying to get this. So I hope you see I did the whole big circle minus the inner circle. And then this guy would be 2, so that'll be 4 pi minus the inner circle, which is 1 pi. And so the outer circle is 7 pi. The inner circle is 3 pi, and so that would be little to large would be 3 to 7. So just let me know if 5 is okay. I can go over it again because it is a hard one. It would be at the very end zone. But like I said, if I just gave you the circle formulas, that would be the biggest help. I got it have you try some hard ones. So Patrick, I could go through it again, just put a question mark up, because it is pretty hard to see. And everybody gets their epiphany at a different moment. Okay, so Patrick's okay. Can you guys try six? and just put your answer in the chat room. So we have, got to shrink this back down. So we have O is the center of a circle and O, B, C, D is a square. So we know O, A equals A, B. The area of the square is 64. So we have to get the side of the square and then your goal is to get the radius O A because if you get the radius then you could get the area of the circle by pi r squared. So I'll let you see if you could do this more complex problem but not too bad taking each step along the way and just put your answer in the chat room.
And if you're stuck, we'll go over it. I just want to help you know that you sometimes you can't see the answer. Yes, it is C. So let's go through it. So if the big square is 64, that means it will be 8 and 8. So this long thing is 8. That makes the radius 4. Thanks, Patrick. And so pi times 4 squared would be 16 pi. Thank you, guys. Okay, let's go on to the next page. So this part is just getting you used to circles. And there were a number of, there was like, I think, three or four circles on test seven that you did, Paul. So we're going to cover those. So here we have A is the center of a circle. The area is 25 pi. Well, we know what to do. We know that's pi r squared. So that means the radius would be 5. Now, this is 5 and this is 5 because they're both radii. We have to get the, our goal is to get the hypotenuse BC. So we'll just do five, we'll pull out the Pythagorean theorem, which we'll do next week. So C is the square root of 50, which is um, five, sorry, a little sloppy. Five times five times two, two quarters. So we can make a marriage of fives like we did. So this will be five square roots of two, which is C. Thank you, College Board, for 10 points. So I'm assuming you guys got that one. This one also is easy, but I would suggest you draw the picture. So we have a circle inscribed in a square. Not a very good picture, sorry. In the area of the square, so if the square is 144, S squared is 144, each side would be 12. And now that helps us because we can make the connection. This is the leap that not a lot of, not a lot of students would do. This is going to be, the diameter is going to be 12. And so each radii is 6, radius is 6. So 36 pi would be our answer. So uh, just put an OK so far because the next one is hard. I don't want to go on to the next one until I know you you both are still with me. And I hope I'm not going too fast. Thanks, Patrick. Now this one is really hard. And then what happened was we put it in the packet and then it was on the test. So that really freaks us out when that happens. So this would be really hard, very hard, I'd say. So this time we have a circle. Ah, and the square is inscribed the circle. So the circle has an area of 18 pi. I know my first thing is to get the radius. And I'm trying not to go too fast, but so this will be 3 times 3 times 2, which will be 3 square roots of 2. So then if this is 3 square roots of 2, and this radius is 3 square roots of 2. The whole, you see the diameter of the square, or the diagonal of the square is the diameter of the circle. So that will be 6 square roots of 2. And then, especially after we do the uh, triangle lesson next week, you'll know that each side of this square is 6. But that would be, a, I mean, I'm really working you Peloton math on that one. So 
let me know if 9 is okay or you want to see 9 again. Probably you'd want to see 9 again, but I'll let you guys decide. Okay, why very good, Paul. Okay, so let me let me draw this on the whiteboard. Good question. Paul says, why isn't it six square roots of two? That was that would be the trap answer. So what we have here is we have this should help me out with a circle. We have a circle. Fix it good. And oh, we, wait, no, he says never mind. Oh, you're good? Six square roots of two, that's the diameter, right? And then the side of the square is just six. Yeah. Yeah. So each each radii, I know this helps me out a little bit. Each rate we make all our mistakes here, so keep asking questions. Patrick, are you okay with this hard one? It'll become clearer next week after we do triangles. Okay, good, Paul. Yeah, they're okay. Oh, good. Okay. Moving on, this number 10. So, a children's wagon. So, sometimes they do these guys. I'm, I'm going to do it on a whiteboard so it all turns out pretty. <laughs> Just because I want to. See how it fixes, that's one plus for technology. Except for it didn't do very good on that one. And my circles are getting smaller. So anyway, do you see this? So the radius is six inches. So if I put a little mark on the tire, every time the wagon wheel rolls, it goes one circumference. So that would be 100 2 pi r, which is r is 6 inches, so that's 1200 pi, but that's inches, and I have to change it to feet, which is in the problem, so I have to divide by 12, so that'll be 100 pi, and you don't have to know any weird conversions, like inches in a foot, seconds in a minute, that kind of thing, and then I know I told you you don't have to know Almost all the time it'll be in terms of pi, but here it isn't, and so the answer is 314, which is B. So let me know if 10 is okay. I just don't want to clip along too fast and lose you both. But this is so great because you don't have to travel anywhere. Thank you, Patrick. Okay. And the last one is a word problem. Oh, he wants you to see that one again. Okay, Paul, no problem. I like drawing the circles on this whiteboard. Because, no. <laughs> no, it's not too bad. Didn't, I, I don't even, I can't even approximate it so that it knows I'm trying to make a circle. Try to make a circle here. <laughs> okay, so each circle has a radius of six inches. So I think you got that part. So the trick is, like if I put a piece of tape on the tire, it would, as the wheel rolls, it'll travel one circumference when the the thing will come up again. And we're just trying to give you every kind of circle problem you might see. So it's going 100 circumferences, which is 102 pi r. r is 6 inches, which would be 1,200 pi inches. But then I'm trying to change that into feet. 
And so that would be 314, because I'd have to multiply by the value of pi, which normally you don't have to do. So did that help, Paul? Or is there one point that's confusing you? Okay, great. So let's go. Again, we're just trying to... So when, you, when a geometry question pops up on the test, you're not thinking, oh, I don't didn't go, I don't remember my geometry. So this one is a word problem. So the number of square units in the area of circle O, so that would be pi r squared, is equal to the number of units in the circumference. So all I had to do was change these words into a math equation. Then I'll have r, r equals 2r. So the radius is 2. I need the area of the circle, which would be 4 pi. Remember, we had that unusual circle where the area equaled the circumference, which is not we only we found the one circle maybe in the universe I don't know yeah. but you think that's the only one mm -hmm. I don't know okay so let's go on to arcs and sectors so a couple things about this so when we do this the arc is just the part of the circumference and the sector is like a pizza slice and so there is a formula down here, but I don't necessarily want you encumbered by more formulas. So all you have to do is find the fraction and then multiply by the fraction. So let's try some book problems. And then there was one on your test. If you could find the one on the test. The first one I would like to do, I'll show you what I mean. Let's go to... 989 number two. If you could find the circle test seven where they yeah, look. Okay. So we're just we're trying an easy one first. And I'd just like to do book problems just to put the icing on the cake and really clench that you guys are comfortable with this. So you won't have to go through a geometry book or study a lot. You just, you can save these packets and look for them and before your tests, but okay. So here we have a circle and it says the circle above has center O. They always put O in the center and has a circumference of 36. What is the length of minor arc AC? So we're trying to find that arc. So this is 90 degrees. So all we have to do is say 90 over the whole circle, which is 360. We only need one fourth of this circumference and one-fourth of 36 is nine. So that's, so I think you guys can see that. You just have to get the fraction. You don't have to use an involved formula. Uh, 747. So let's go one through one from test seven. 747 number? 34. 34, so I think uh, that- Porter's here. What? Porter's here. It's what? I said Porter has arrived. Oh, Porter. Oh, great. Great to have you with us. I knew you were doing a sport, correct? But anyway, we're in the circle packet. You're fine. And if you could just get the circle packet out, but we're doing a problem in the book on page, oh, lots of soccer, yeah. Well, you're keeping in shape. So you're healed from your injury. Hey, Paul, your decimal point, point is in the wrong place. 
Okay, so we're doing 747. So we have three gentlemen who start with P. That's funny. Mm -hmm. Oh, good. I'm glad you're healed. 747. And this was in the book. So, Porter, before you leave tonight, we'll give you a practice test to take at home. Because I don't know if you ever took one in the summer once you had that injury. So we're looking at 747. And we have 100 degrees. And it says, what fraction of the area of the circle is the area of the shaded region? So we know the whole circle is 360. So you could write 5 18 or what's the decimal, Jim? Um, 0.277 or 0.278, which makes me think that Paul just moved the decimal place to the wrong yeah. spot. So, and you could use a calculator on this question. So, um, is everybody good? So just put 34 okay in the chat room. Thanks, Porter. What are the chances you have to do the probability of having three <laughs> kids on the three students, they'll all be guys, and they'll all start with P? That's got to be a probability. So that would be one half boys, one out of 26 uh, alphabet letters. So that's one out of every, but then I have three at a time, I'm not sure. And all of the letters aren't used evenly, like a lot of people don't start, like Zorro with the baby names. Yeah. Okay, so everybody's good yeah, with 34. Good. Paul, you're, Paul's good now, I think. Yeah, everything, everyone's good. Okay, so we're gonna do, go to the next page of the packet and we'll wait for and Paul, you can go back and watch the first part of this, but this next part is just uh, like you, normally you do homework. So we're just, this is sort of our homework. I'm trying to just tell you about getting the fraction over the whole 360. But I'm glad you're here, Porter, because we're going to be doing some harder circle problems. The, the harder circle things are coming. So we're on pizza problems, and I don't know why the pepperoni is all different sizes. So if a pizza is eight inches across, that's the diameter. So the radius would be four. How many inches of crust does the whole pizza have? Eight pi. How many inches of topping does the pizza have? Sixteen pi. So now we look at this. Here's a slice of that pizza with a 90 degree point. So obviously there's four slices. So each inch of crust would be one fourth times eight pi or two pi. And the topping would be one fourth of 16 pi or four pi. Okay, here we have another pizza. This is 12 inches across. So the crust would have 12 pi the topping, the radius would be 6, so 36 pi. 40 degree slices, we have to see how many are in there. And it would be 9. So we're going to do 1 ninth of 12 pi. And we could reduce that to 4 thirds pi. And so how many square inches of topping does the one slice have? Just one ninth of 36 pi, which would be four pi. So that's not so bad. So let's take a little segue and try some book problems. So the first one, would be 
let's see, from your test seven. So we just took, yeah, we did that one. So we're gonna go to page 864 and we're gonna try number 20. Let's see what's awaiting us there. Oh, it's the hardest one. Yikes. So only 6% of the country would get this one. So let's look at this. So we have a circle and points A and B lie on the circle with a radius of one and arc set AB is this arc AB is pi over three. Now this is a hard one. So I'm gonna do it two ways. Uh, first of all, let me ask all three of you guys whose names start with P. <laughs> uh, have you seen radii, radii, or what am I saying, degree to radian conversions? And it sort of depends about your math curriculum. And since you're going to three different schools, I don't expect everybody has seen this. So have you ever seen degree radian or change radians back to degree? Okay, so Paul's seen that. Oh my gosh, Porter already has the answer. Okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> High five, Porter. So I'm going to do this two ways. So first, we know the whole circle, they tell us that in the formula page, is two pi. So we're just creating a fraction. And so that we're just taking pi over three divided by two pi would be pi over three times uh, one six, or sorry, I have to, 2 pi over 1 would be 1 over 2 pi. The pi's would cancel and I would get a 6. But I can do it another way. And we're going to get to radian degree conversion because that's something we need to know. So 2 pi would be the whole circle, which is 360. Ours is pi over 3 which we're going to do this conversion in a second. That's pi over 180. So that would be 60 degrees and 60 over 360 would indeed be 16. You could also do 0.166 or 0.167, but you have to carry it out three places. So everybody's good with that one. Let's try another one. And again, I'm not being that nice. Let's go to 597, number 20. Okay, hardest one, they don't expect the average kid to get this. So let's look at it. You can try it ahead of me if you want to. And so the figure's not drawn to scale. And what that means when you see that, that means that you can't eyeball it. You can't just guess it. It's not going to be this big. You just can't, because obviously it's a grid, and what are the chances you'll get the exact right number? So, arc BC is two fifths of the circumference. So that'll be two fifths, see if anybody's ahead of me, of 360 degrees. 
So for a really hard one, it's not so bad. And you would just grid in 144. So just say 20 is okay in the chat room so I know. I'm just trying to give you a number of book problems just to um, so when you see them on the test you can handle anything. So Porter's good with 20. Okay how I went from 72 to 144 because it's two fits Paul so if you take I just 5 into 36 is 72 degrees times 2 or you know two fits is 0.4 you could have done it either way good question either way you're going to get 144 right, this is a 2 right here And so I multiplied 2 times 72. I didn't really show that real well, sorry. No, I didn't show it real well. So we're going to one more. We make all our mistakes here. Let's go to 1014. I'll write this page number down. And this one's pretty brutal. But we're just developing your math synapses for everything you might face on the test. Okay, so we have a circle. Come on, fix it. Good. And we have this. I mean, this deals with triangles. So the triangles. We're doing triangles next week, Porter. I didn't mention that. But um, so here, our job is to find x. And so we know that this is 20. So did you see that I have to draw this line? And they don't say clue draw the line. So if this is 20, this would be 20. That's 40, this would be 140. Also all the radii are equal, so this would be 20. So any circle, any triangle in a circle has to be, let me just put this, triangle in a circle has to be isosceles if the sides are the radius. So this is 140. So now I have 240. The whole circle here would be 360. And so, did I do that right? Let's see. 280, my, my bad. So X has to be 80 degrees. And it's sort of drawn to scale, so we would be okay with that. So just let me know 36, okay. Again, the secret is to draw the line. And they don't tell you that. Thanks, Porter. Paul's okay. Thanks, Patrick. Okay. So let's go to the next pa page. We're going to blitzkrieg through some last arcs and sectors. So this would be an easy one. Diameter is 12. That means the radius is 6. 6 times 6 would be 36 pi divided into 6 sections. So each section would be 6 pi. Okay, this next one is a little trickier. 
a circle with an area. So the area is 16 pi. So that means the radius is 4. And so it's a little crazy because they're asking for the perimeter. So basically, I got to get this, which is 4, this, which is 4, and this part of the arc, which would be 1 eighth, because it says it's 8 parts, of 2 times pi times 4, 1 eighth of 8 pi would just be pi. So our ultimate answer is 8 plus pi. So, everybody good with that one? Just say 2 is okay. Wow, thank you, gentlemen. So, I'd like you to try 3. And just put your answer in the chat room. You're just trying to get the area of this sector. And you know how many degrees this means, so you know what fraction of the circle you need. And so Patrick knows he has to take a practice test. Porter, uh, when we're done with the circles, I'm going to give you a practice test to take. because. Next week is probably your PSAT, and I, you know, it would be good because I think it was mostly the end of the class that we lost you, and I can't remember if you took a practice test or not. So does anybody have an answer? Okay, so, okay, so Paul says A, but look, we need 90 over 360, we need 1 fourth of pi times 8 squared, which would be, we make all our mistakes here, this would go in to 8, so we would have 1 fourth of 64. See that, Paul? Which would be 16 pi. So the actual answer is C. Yeah, good, Paul. You just get the fraction. Again, I'm just trying to... Thanks, Patrick. Okay, this is the hardest one. But I know that some of you are aspiring to really high math scores. So... I have to put some of the hardest things on the test. So stay with me for this one. It's uber hard. So AB is the arc of the circle. So AB is 30 over 360. What fraction do we have? So we have 1 12th of 2 pi r, because we're dealing with an arc, is 9 pi. And I know my big thing is to get the radius. So that'll be 1 6. And next week uh, for Porter, we're doing triangles, and there's only one trig identity that comes on the test. But anyway, that would be um, so we're going to divide by pi, multiply by 6. So the radius is 54. Now we have to get the area. That's going to be 1 12th of pi times 54 times 54. And you'd have a calculator for this, which would be 243. Yeah, I know, Paul. I know. On number three. So let's, I'll give you a second to process number four. And you can let me know how you're doing. This is as hard as it gets. So 
I have to show you this part. So, okay. So Paul's okay with four. That was it. Was a hard one. Thank you. Yes, thanks, Patrick. And Porter, you okay with four? Yes. Okay, so on to the next page. So instead of giving you the time to do this because we have to cover two more critical things, I'm just going to blitzkrieg through this. That's the German word. It means what? Lightning war. Lightning war. <laughs> okay. Blitz and Krieg is war? Mm -hmm. Okay. I didn't know that. So we're just going to lightning through this. That's really true. That's lightning. So anyway, I have all these circle problems, but I'm just going to go through them. If you have a question on one, just put it in the chat room. But like I said, we're just going to blitz Krieg through this. And I'm just hoping to strengthen everything up. And you can even go ahead of me if you'd like. So here we have like a basketball court. So BC is two ABs, so this will be 12. And actually, you can sort of see this part of the court would go in to fill in here. And you would just do 12 times 6, which is 72. Thank you, College Board. Okay, let's try this pedal thing. So the big circle is 12 squared pi. And I'm, I'm watching the chat room, so is Jim. And then the little circles will each be a radius of 6. And so we have one circle and another circle. So we have 2 pi times 6 squared which is, so we have 140 pi with the whole big circle. This is 72 pi. And so the shaded region would be 72 pi, which is answer choice C. And again, I'm trying to, uh, I know how busy you guys are with all your activities. So when this is just, so put a question mark in like three. I didn't get it or something. Three is easy, actually. So every straight line on the test we know is 180. So if this is 160, this would be 20. And so uh, BC, AB would be eight times as big because eight times 20 is 160. Here we have another shaded one. I'm sorry I'm going through this fast. So we have to get the shaded region, which we can't really get. So we have to do the rectangle minus one quarter of a circle and one quarter would be a half a circle. So this, every radius is one. So that means this rectangle would be 2 times 1, and then 1 half pi times 1 squared. That would just equal 2 minus pi over 2. And so that would be answer choice B, onward and upward. So what if they gave you one like this? Like I said, this beats going through an entire geometry book not knowing what you're going through. This is like concentrated, but I know it's like Peloton math. So the diameters of five dotted semicircles are equal. So we know one, two, three, four, five little diameters are going to equal 20. So each diameter is going to be four. That means the radius is two. So let's see how many. The dotted line curve. So it's one circle another circle, and a half. So we have two and a half circles times pi r squared. Okay. 
so that would be 5 halves times 4 pi, which will just give us 10 pi. And so if I'm going too fast, just, just put TF in the, too fast. But I'm, I'm just, this one's easy, number six. In the circle above, or above the circle with center O has a radius of six. So we already know what to do here. I'm getting an arc, so I just need 90 over 360 of two times pi times six which would be one-fourth of 12 pi, which would be three pi. Thank you, College Board. Okay, moving up to seven. Seven is hard. Now, before we came up, you came on board, Porter, I gave them something that we've seen on the test. When a line is tangent to a circle, at the point of tangency, it's perpendicular. So we know this whole thing has to be 90 degrees right here by that fun fact. So this is a hard one. So I'm going to ask you guys if you understand this. So we have to do multi-steps. So every straight line is 180. This is 50. This would be 130. The whole triangle is 180, so each of these guys is 25 and 25. I'm sort of drawing it. I can't. I don't know. I can draw it better if you'd like. And then we have 90 minus 25 for y, which is 65. So I'm glad I got to share that little fun fact, Porter, because we've seen that on tests where you have to know. So there's no, I didn't tell you this, there's no proofs on the test, guys. So hallelujah for that. So let me know if seven is okay, because I could draw a bigger picture, which I might, maybe should do. But I'll see how far, how you guys were coming on this. So every triangle in a circle is going to be an isosceles triangle if the radii are the legs. Oh, wow. So Patrick's good with that. Awesome. So is Paul. Great. So Porter, you good with seven? So we'll see how, we'll keep going. He came back from soccer practice, so he might have gotten something to eat. So we'll go, we'll move on. This eight is easy. So we just have a circle that has a radius of three for C. B is one and A is two. And so go, to go all the way around the circle, we would just add them up. Thank you, Porter. It would be 12. Pac-Mans. Again, we're just trying to make it a little fun here. So if we have a square and each side is four. And so if you like math, you, you might gravitate towards engineering or medicine or computers. So if this is four, which is the radius, this Pac-Man will be three-fourths of the area. So it's 12 pi for this Pac-Man. And so 12 pi for this Pac-Man. And together it would be 24 pi. And if you were under the illusion that you could just take one-fourth, it doesn't work because there's an overlap here. And then number 10, a fan is created by gluing paper to seven sticks. So if we have seven sticks, we're going to have six spaces. This was a hard one on a PSAT a few years ago. So it's pretty easy to see if the fan is all the way open, it would be a piece of cake. Everything would be oh, 30 degrees, right? 
but it's only open five six on the semicircle. So that would be five six of one eighty, which would be uh, so we have six spaces into one fifty. So each little space would be 25 degrees. And if I don't see anything on the chat board, I guess I, I assume you guys are good. So we're now moving, whoa. Okay. We're now moving on to degree radian conversion. And so, um, let's see. Paul has seen this, I think. Porter, have you seen this? And also Patrick, I just have to know because I'll go slower if you haven't seen it. Obviously on your calculator, they have it. And we put in the back of the packet, the unit circle, which you thankfully don't have to know for this test. At first we thought you were gonna have to know it. So I'm just waiting to hear if you guys have seen radian degree conversion. It depends on your school, actually. So whether they had it in your geometry curriculum or not. Okay, so Patrick, I'm gonna go pretty slow. Okay, so, um, so anyway, like we said, the whole circle is two pi or 360. So you don't really have to know about the negative of it. And so anyway, here's what I usually do, uh, Patrick. I use a, we use a dimensional analysis. So if it's 40 degrees, all you need to do is 180 is pi, because the whole circle. And so then 40 over 180 would reduce to 2 ninths pi. So let's do a couple more because if you haven't seen it before, we have pi over 5. This time we put pi in the denominator, 180 in the numerator, and so we'll get 3, 36 degrees. All right, so let's try these together and then I'm going to give you some book ones. So if we have 45 degrees, that would be 45 is, put degrees in the bottom, 180 is pi, so that would go in, uh, so that would be pi over four, right Jim? Yep. And so this guy, if we had 60 degrees, I hope Patrick, this is, or all of you guys, this is sort of making sense. So we put the degrees in the denominator because we want the degrees to cancel and pi. And so 60 over 180 would be one third pi. And we actually had that in a problem or pi over three. So this guy, we have radians. So this would be pi in the denominator. So the pi's will cancel and we'll get 150 degrees. And so this one would be seven pi over four. And so this again would be 40, let's see, seven, two, what is it, 215? 315, seven times 45. Okay. Okay, let's do some more on the next page to see if if it sort of sinks in a little bit. I just want you, you probably only get one of these, if that, and, um, but I just want you comfortable. So if we have pi over six, that's pi is gonna be 180. So that'll be 30 degrees. Now we have the degrees, so we do 180 
is pi. You see these are just inverses of each other. So that'll be 120 over 180, which would be 2 pi over 3, right? Mm -hmm. And let's try this one. Pi over 2, we put the pi in the denominator, is 180. So 1 half of eight, 180 is 90 degrees. And 3 pi over 4 radians, that would be pi is 180. And so that would be 45, which is... 135? Mm -hmm. Okay. So I'm going to try. Uh, so I hope that all you're going to use is this or this and just convert it. It's not so bad, but I realize if you hadn't seen it before, I'm sort of shocking you with something. So uh, let's go to. There was one on their test. Where is that one? Oh, right. Yeah, let me find it. I think it was on the note calculator. Yeah, I think so. Uh, it's on page 731. Number what? Number 18. So it's a hard one, and it's no calculator. So let's go there. And I know it's, it's sort of hard that some of this stuff is on the test and you can't remember seeing it, and that's why we're reviewing it. So, problem's pretty short. We have a 70, 720 degree angle, and we write it as a pi. Obviously, we can't write it in the pi. They just want to know what a is. So, I'm going to see if you can try this. So, we're just going to do 720 is 180 pi. Can you Tell me in the chat room what number A would be, and it's going to be an integer. Isn't it? Yeah. Okay. Yes, Paul. And, and Patrick, I know if you haven't seen this, it's a bit of a struggle. And I don't know if Porter has seen this before. And we're just going to go a little more to the break before we have a break. Because we only have one more thing to conquer here. So... We would just say 720 divided by 180 would be 4. And so it would be 4 pi, but A is going to be 4. So let's see if Porter or Patrick, if you're still confused, let me know. I'm going to have you guys do one more before we go on to circle uh, the unit or the coordinate circle. Let's see, we're waiting for Patrick to see if he's got it yet, and Porter. I just don't want you to face things. Thank, thank you, Patrick. Thank you, Porter. Okay, let's try one more. Go to the last page of your packet. And so that's number, we're going to page, I'm gonna have you try one more to know, I, to know you clinched this. 27, and I know sometimes you're facing new stuff. Page 27, we're doing number three. Basically, we, it's sort of the same thing. We have 900 degrees is x pi, and we're trying to get x. So I'm going to let you take a minute, and once you solve this one, we're going to close out of this.
See if you could actually get an answer. This math lesson isn't so bad because we have a, a reading passage. We're going over science reading tonight. So maybe just about 20 minutes more, we might go a little over seven, and then I'll give you a nice 10 minute break. So let's see if anybody can solve this. Yes, Porter, yes. And you can't grid in the five, the pie, so all that you would put in is five. Because it's a grid in. Very good. I just wanted you guys to try it, and I knew you may not have done this in a while. So now if you're not going to get a weird one. You're going to get something like this, like 720 or... And you can almost see you're going around the circle once, which is 360, around it again, which is 360, and then half. And so that'll add up to 5 pi. So you're basically going 720, you're, you'll get 900 degrees. So you got it, Porter. Good job. Let's see if Patrick and Paul got it. Then we only have one more thing. And it's also probably something you never saw or it wasn't drilled on in school. And that'll be our last math thing. So we might as well do it now. And then you guys, I hope, Porter, you had something to eat after soccer. But you'll have in about 20 minutes. Okay, great, Paul. And Patrick, are you good with five? I just want you to have a comfort level with these because I'm dusting off cobwebs from a geometry class probably two years ago. Thank you. Okay, our last thing. Okay, we're now going to the circle on the coordinate plane. And what we've seen for the last three years is there one of these on every test. And it's a little unfair because they don't give you the formula. So this is the formula. The center of the circle is HK and R is your radius. And so I apologize that you probably weren't drilled on it because, you know, but they put this one question on every test. There was one on test seven. So we're going to go through here. And um, so let's look at this equation. Have so, you seen that before? Oh, let me see. I, I should ask. Have you seen this formula? And again, we have three high schools represented here, so I'm not sure. This will be our last thing to conquer. But since it's on every test, I want everybody to have a good working ability. I just want to know, have you ever seen this? I know there's a little lag with the internet. Okay, so Paul's never seen it. I understand. That's why it's here for you. Because... They've been putting one of these on every SAT. Yeah, one on every SAT. So we can pretty much guarantee you're going to see one of these. But I have to give you a working knowledge of this. So the center is going to be HK. So Paul hasn't seen it. Porter, have you ever seen this? Or Patrick? I'm going to maybe assume you haven't. Because usually we find students have never seen this.
Okay, so let's go to this. So here's an example. The center, do you see, is at 4, 3. And the radius is, this is r squared, so the radius is 3. So this represents this formula. So we're going to draw our own here. So this is what's tricky. Do you see if it's a plus 2, that means it's x minus a minus 2. So my center is actually minus 2, 5. That's the tricky part. That's the thing to watch. They might catch you on that. So I'm going to draw, this is my center. And you can draw it on yours. And then the radius is 2, so we're just going to go 2. And so that's how our circle will look. Okay, so let's go on to the uh, next page. So the next thing we're covering is if you have a circle and you have two endpoints, how do you get the center? And all you do is average the x's and average the y's. So this would be 6 over 2 and 8 over 2. So the center would be at 3, 4. That's pretty self-explanatory. Okay, so, um, huh, wait a minute, before, let's see, I guess I should just do this. All right, so here we get into the mire, because Jimmy likes to use the distance formula. I like, I'm a visual person, I like <laughs> to see it. Sorry. So we have two, let's look at this circle, this point. So we have a circle. Uh, first, let me draw the endpoints. It's negative 8, 10. So you can tell me if you like to use the distance formula or if you like my method, which is the picture. So we have negative 8, 10, and negative 4. 6. And they're both based on the Pythagorean theorem, so it's not like we're, you know, doing something different. So this has a difference of 4. This difference is 4. And so I would just do 4 squared. And I'm trying to get the radius so that's 32 is the whole diameter. So I can simplify that into five twos, make two marriages, get four square roots of two for the diameter. So the radius would be half that or two square roots of two. So I'd like you to know I'd like you to know whether you want to use the distance formula, which is Jim's method, you could just say Jim, or my method, which is to draw the triangle. I just like to draw it because I don't have any negative exponents I have to worry about. I could mess up. So just let me know which method you're going to pick. I'm telling you a break will be in 15 minutes or less. But I don't want to stop now because you can finish this packet. So just let me know which method do you like. I hope I didn't lose you guys because you're going to get a break soon. Okay, so Paul likes Jim's. Yay for Jim. It doesn't matter, I know. Anybody else out there want to pick a method? Patrick doesn't care. Okay. So, um, 
Okay, so Patrick's good with both of them. Okay, so let's go to the next page and try some. So first, let's try an easy one in the book, page 336, number 11. So let's go to the whiteboard. This would be an easy one, and I'm going to build up to the harder ones. So we're on page 336, number 11, an easy one. And just put the answer in the chat room. So I think all three of you can handle this now, even though you haven't seen this. So they tell you the center. Just put the answer in the chat room. I just want you to nail the, well, it's a number 11, so it's not that easy. So you just tell me if it's A, B, C, or D in the chat room. And you're just going to use this formula. And again, I apologize if you haven't seen it before. And after this, we're going to try a hard one from your test. Again, we're just going a little over, but you'll still get your you'll get your break. Anybody see what the answer is? A, B, C, or D. I know it's hard to process because you never saw it before. That's why you do homework with math. Oh, are we? No, we're not done. We don't have to scroll down, right? No. So just put your answer in the chat room. Anybody solve it yet? Paul's confused. Okay. So here's the formula. It's X minus H squared. And so H is our X value. So that would be X minus 5 squared. Plus, I know you never, never saw this before. Y minus 7 squared equals 2 squared, which would be 4. And so it would be answer choice A. So HK is always your center. Yes, so HK is my center, which here is, this is H and that's K. Does that help? Almost at break. But I, I want you to have clarity on this. Patrick, how are you doing, or Porter? Okay, now it makes sense. What about Patrick and Porter? We're, we're getting to the break. I know you're getting weary. We're covering like probably six weeks of math. Okay, so Patrick's got it a little better. I know it, I'm facing, giving you something and you don't even have homework on it or time to master it, but you've got it. 
Okay, so let's go to another, a harder one in the book that was on your test, I think. So I'm going to go to 7, 44, number 29. And this was just on the test you took. Thanks, Patrick. That helps me out a lot because my job as a teacher is to help you shine. I'm going to be looking for you at the college fair, so if you see us, because I have no idea. So let's go to 744, and we're going to tackle this one together because it's hard. You can see it's the end of a calculator section. So we have a circle that's this, x plus 3 plus y minus 1 is 25. So what this means is the h is a negative 3, because this would be h minus, and the, the h k, k would be 1. So if I draw, I would guess I would draw the picture. So negative 3, and 1. So that's the center of my circle and this is the radius squared so the radius is going to be 5. So from this point which is minus 3 1 let's go 5 to the right which would take us to 2 1 and let's go 5 to the left which would take us to negative 8 1 and so now we can draw my circle. Ah. And so Jimmy would rather do this with a, a distance formula. But anyway, let's check the points. So we want to get one that's not in the interior. Thanks for staying with me, guys. Almost at a break. So if we look at this, negative 7, 3, that's going to be in the circle. Negative 3, 1 is the center of the circle. 0, 0 is in the center of the circle. But look, 3, 2, because this stops at 2. 3, 2 is my answer because it would be outside the circle. Oh good, you did get you did get it right when you took the test. Excellent. Now Paul, you'll know how to do it. So Patrick, you're okay. He got D when he the test that he mailed to us. Okay, great. So let's go to the packet. We're almost at a break. So here we have 3 minus 2, so that would be x minus 3 plus y plus 2 is 5 squared. And so this one would be answer choice C. And so this one's a little trickier. So we would have x minus a minus 2, which would be x plus 2 plus y minus 4. If they didn't have this, this is a surefire 10 points. Could you not do it and get a, still get a good score? Yes. So this one would be c as well. OK, so on this one, we're just averaging the x's which would be 4 over 2, which would be 2. Average the y's, which would be 5.5, .5, and so that would be b. Okay, one more. So if it's x squared plus y squared is 25, that means it's going through the origin, because there's that's no... That's your center, right? Yeah, that's my center. 
So here's my center. The radius is 5. And I have the point 3 over. Let's so use a different color. 3 over 4 up. And next week we're going to learn about 3, 4, 5 triangles. So we want the line that's, so here's our, our circle. We know this line is going to be, have a slope of rise over run, 4 over 3. So the line that's tangent to it, remember we said it's going to be perpendicular. So we have to make, the, this is a review, so that'll be a negative 3 fourths, which would be the only one with negative 3 fourths is A. So let's go to the last. So this Jimmy did the outside inside thing with the distance formula. So you can look at that if you'd like to. Now the last thing I have to co conquer is this. Have you gentlemen ever completed the square? Is our last thing. Okay, so Paul sort of remembers doing this. So this whole page explains completing the square. But let's dive in because I want to give you a break. So here we have, wow, well, we only have a couple, little bit more to do. So if we have x squared minus 8x, what we have to do is divide this middle term by 2. And so this would be x minus 4. And so when we FOIL this, we get x squared um, minus 8x. But look, I get a plus 16. So to make it equivalent, I have to subtract 16. If You can look before here to all the explanation. So let's look at this equation. Uh, we're dividing this by 2. So this would be x plus 3, y minus 0, equals 55. So I have to FOIL x plus 3, and you can take the time to look later at it if you'd like. So that'll be x squared plus 6x plus 9. So like... Uh, Teeter totter. If I add 9 to this side, I have to add 9 to this side. So if 64 is the radius squared, the radius would be 8. Okay, let's look at this example. We're almost done. And we'll give you a nice 10 minute break. But you could get one like this, so that's why I want you comfortable with this. So we're going to divide this by 2. It might be too much math, but. So this will be x uh, plus or minus 5 squared. Five. 4, sorry. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. So here I'm going to get, when I FOIL this, I'll get x squared plus 8x plus 16. So if I add 16 to this side, I have to add 16 here. Here I'll get y squared um, minus 10y plus 25. So I have to add 25 to this side. So that'll be 49 is r squared. So my radius would be 7. Just in case you get one of those. So our, we'll do this one, and I'll I won't I'll leave the other one for later. So we have an x y. Again, I'm a visual person. So we have one three, and we have minus one minus three. 
And so we know the center is the origin because I average those. So let's, I like to see it. So it's going to be 2 on the bottom and minus 3 to 3 will be 6. So I'm going to use the good old Pythagorean theorem. You could use the distance formula. And I'll go over this if you want to. I know you're probably exhausted. So this will be c squared is 40. So that's c is my diameter. So my diameter is square root of 40. So I'm going to simplify this. I'll just do this over here. And I will get, let's see, we have 2, 5 times 8. So this will be um, 2 square root of 10 for the diameter region. Yeah. So the radius will just be the square root of 10 because I divide this by 2. And so now, um, I'm good to go because I have to take the square root of 10 was my radius. And if I square that, I'm just going to get 10. And there's no, there's no, the center was 0, 0, so I knew A and B were out. Okay, so if, if you're both okay, let me know. If you have a question on this, let me know. I won't do this one, and we did the last one. If you want to do this one, the answer is two. But I'm going to give you a break until 724. Okay, let me put this on the whiteboard. So get something to eat. Okay, you want to heat it, right? Yep, I'll bring it for you. Okay. Thank you, gentlemen. Jim will be back at 724-ish for the reading.
in support of Curtis and Reese.
All right, let me know if you're back. And find the science passage packet for the English. Okay, Patrick back. Just give everyone a minute to get situated. Paul's back. Okay, I guess we're just going to dive right in. So we're going to do the science passage packet. For our English and this is for the reading section so the first section of the SAT is the reading test and this is the science component so there will either be two science passages or you may get one science passage in a pair of passages on a similar topic and although the theme of the passage is scientific they're not really testing you on skills that you learn in science classes. They're not testing your ability in chemistry. They're not testing your ability ability with biology. Oh, Paul, it's this uh, this this one here. Good question. So I'll let you find that science passage packet. Yep, just find your science science passage packet. Should be in there somewhere. Yeah, no problem. Okay, so although the theme of the passage may be scientific, they're not really testing your ability with science-related classes. So they're not testing your ability to create a hypothesis, to create an experiment, to test your experiment. They're, they're, they're really just testing you in reading comprehension. And I also like to say that the text themselves they don't really read like science textbooks. It's not like reading a chemistry textbook. It's not like reading a biology textbook. The, the passages are, are similar to reading uh, something like a Scientific American or a Discover magazine. It's something like that. It's more like science for the layperson. It's science for everybody. It's science that anyone can understand. So they're not really testing you on your ability that, you know, things that you pick up from science classes so much. Really, they're testing you on skills that you learned in English class. It's just reading comprehension. That's what I like to say about, about the science passage. So it's, kind of, it's going to read like science for the layperson, science for everybody. It's going to sound like a science magazine of some kind, not so much a textbook. It's not going to be mitosis and meiosis. You're only going to need a superficial understanding of whatever the scientific method, methodology is. So we're going to try one. So we're going to read this science passage. You're going to learn about this fish. So read about this interesting fish. And you're just going to answer the questions that go along with this. I'm going to give you some time to try it. You're just going to answer all the way up to question 10. And then just put done or finished in the chat room so that I know that you're done. And then we'll go over this one.
Okay, Paul's done. Yeah, take your time, Patrick. We're, no worries. I'm not trying to rush you guys. Oh, okay, great. So you're all done. Let's look at the first one. All right, so if you see the words primary purpose on the SAT, they are testing you on main ideas. So we have to think about the main idea of this passage. The primary purpose of the passage is what? Does it speculate about unidentified sea creatures? Discuss muse uh, museum curation, relate a notable discovery, or does it study deep sea fish? So when they test when they test you on main idea, they're often testing you on main idea versus a detail. And answer choice B is certainly a detail. So I'm going to look at that part of the passage. So the fact that Marjorie. Courtney Latimer was a curator of this museum. It, that's just a detail. That's not the primary purpose of the passage or a main idea or anything like that. So I'm going to cross it off. That's not, surely that's not the purpose of the passage. Do we have any unidentified sea creatures in the passage? I don't think so. We're talking about the coelacanth, so we've identified everything. I'm going to cross off A as well. So either the passage relates a notable discovery or it studies deep sea fish plural. It's mostly the notable discovery. Like even though, even if I look at the passage, just glancing at the passage, all of this, all the way up to here, is just the discovery of the fish. That whole part is about this interesting discovery and then rediscovery. They found another sample. But that's all about the discovery, so that is mainly what this passage is about. It's not so much a study of deep sea fish as it is mostly about this notable discovery. 
So that's the main idea question. They often they often compare main ideas to details, trying to trick you with a detail. Uh, number two is a vocab question. Vocabulary. This is how they test. Um, vocabulary on, on the test, it's always in context. And they like to just play around with different dictionary definitions for the word that's in quotation marks. So, for example, to upset someone could mean to irritate them or could mean to perturb them. It's the same thing. An upset could be a defeat. We didn't expect that team to win. That, that, that was an upset. That defeat was an upset, right? Unexpected, an unexpected defeat could be an upset. So they're just playing around with different dictionary definitions of this word. Let's see what it means in the context of that sentence, though. And you can always read the words back into the sentence. I like that strategy. I think it, it takes seconds, and it's very useful to know what fits in there. So the discovery of a living coelacanth would upset, would upset the established order of the scientific world as the creatures were thought to have gone extinct millions of years before. So is that upset in the sense of I upset you, I hurt your feelings, I irritated or perturbed you? No. I'm, I'll read it in the sense of just so you can see that it doesn't fit. The discovery of a living coelacanth would irritate the established order of the scientific world. That makes no sense. That's gibberish. So it's not irritate or perturb, which means the same thing. I'll read defeat in the sentence. Let's see if defeat fits. The discovery of a living coelacanth would defeat the established order of the scientific world. That's nonsense. I'm going to cross off defeat. So let's try disturb. It had better fit since it's the last answer. Let's try disturb. The discovery of a living coelacanth would disturb the established order of the scientific world as the creatures were thought to have gone extinct millions of years before. And that, that one makes perfect sense. So it disturbed the balance in the sense that if I disturb the balance of this table, maybe my coffee would fall off or something like that. It disturbed the balance of the scientific community because they thought this fish was long extinct. And it turns out it's not. All right, so number three is another vocabulary question. And I like reading the words back in the sentence. I think that that is a handy strategy for this type of question. The only problem is if, if you read this, if you read unusual back in the sentence uh, for this one, for number three, you might be tricked into thinking that distinctive could mean this. So I do like I do like reading the words back in the sentence. I think that's a great strategy. The only problem is it can't the word cannot violate its own dictionary definition. And if I look this up, if I look at this word in a dictionary, the word distinctive never means unusual. It just doesn't have that meaning. So even if even if you read unusual back in the sentence and you thought it made sense. That's, that's okay, I like the strategy, but it cannot violate its own dictionary definition. Let me try to read the sentence, and let me try to read answer choice D back in the sentence. All right, dissection of coelacanths has yielded knowledge of many distinctive features. Hinged brain cases, lobed fins, hollow spines filled with oil, distinctive tail fins, and oil-filled bodies. So you might certainly say to yourself, yeah, these, these sound like unusual fish. But the only problem is distinctive never means unusual. What's distinctive about it is it, what's characteristic of it. What distinguishes the coelacanth from other fish? What are its distinguishing traits? What are its distinctive features? What are its characteristic features? Let me read characteristic in here. Dissection of coelacanths has yielded knowledge of many characteristic features. Hinged brain cases, lobed fins, hollow spines filled with oil, etc. So that's why three is D. Just be careful because I think that B is sort of a trap or a trick. Trick sort of. Uh, they're trying to trick you into thinking that that'll fit, but it won't. Uh, number four, the passage indicates the coelacanths are what? Are they scarce, isolated, agile, or intelligent? So this is actually kind of a tricky question uh, for number four. 
I know right away that the passage never mentions the intelligence of this fish. It also never mentions whether they are skillful swimmers, whether they are poor swimmers. So I really know nothing about the agility nor the intelligence of this fish. I just don't. I have no indication of either of those things. I'm going to cross it off. I don't think that the passage ever makes that claim. So I already have it down to two. When it, it's now, it's just a coin toss if we were to randomly pick. So that's that's always better. But I still want to see if I can eliminate one of these other wrong answer choices. So is this fish scarce, or is it isolated? And this is kind of a hard question, because you may be tempted into thinking that these fish are necessarily scarce. But the, the passage actually makes no indication either way. We know it was difficult for them to locate another sample, but that may have nothing to do with the scarcity of this fish. There may be many of them living down there. It might just because their habitat is hard to get to. So if they live 700 meters below the ocean surface, I've never been that, that deep in the ocean. I think few people ever have. So that may be why it's hard to find a sample. It may have nothing to do with the scarcity of the fish. I do, however, know that they are isolated. And now, this is one of those two-part questions. Oh, we zoomed in. They are isolated to a very particular habitat. And now I have to find the evidence. So where does the passage indicate that these fish are isolated? It happens in lines 62 through 65. Let me read these lines. Unfortunately, this strong adaptation to the ocean depths where few creatures can survive may be what causes their abrupt deaths at the surface. No coelacanth has ever been captured alive. So right, right there, that's some good evidence that these fish are isolated, which was my previous answer. On to number six, the passage compares coelacanth to humans with regard to what? Is it with regard to the locomotion? Ancestry, reproduction, or habitation. I'm just going to find this part of the passage where they compare us. They compare the fish to humans right here. Uh, I'm kind of like around line 72. Like human beings, coelacanths practice tetrapod movement. Uh, tetra means four. So just as we move our arms in unison. With our legs as we walk, coelacanth fins function likewise in their propulsion. So I thought we were bipods, but I guess apparently we're tetrapods. Maybe because uh, historically, previously in our in our um, evolution, we were on all fours. I, I imagine that's why we're tetrapods. So we still have a remnant of that. We move our hands as we walk, even though we're primarily on two feet at this point. Um, so yeah, that's where they compare them to humans right there. Similar with regard to locomotion, how we get around. So the fish moves its, moves its arm-like fins similar to the way that we do. Tetrapod motion. Interesting. Okay. They compare them to sharks with regard to reproduction, not human beings. And we already know that we, won't, we don't have a similar habitat. Um, nor ancestry. All right, on to number seven. Which choice provides the best answer for the previous question? So the part where I found the tetrapod movement uh, for seven was D. That's our evidence. So we are on number eight now. Just a couple more questions left for this passage. Not like a typical science passage for you. What was the purpose of paragraph five? Let's take a look at, I'm just going to number the paragraph so one, two, three, four. This is paragraph five right here. So they're asking us about this paragraph. And this paragraph basically just explains what the coelacanths are physically. What, how are their bodies constructed? How do they produce offspring? All, all that sort of uh, information. So that's paragraph five. It's not the discovery the discovery came before paragraph five. Paragraphs one through four, that was all about the discovery and the rediscovery of this fish. And coelacanth evolution, or lack thereof, is actually the next paragraph. 
That'd be paragraph six. So the next paragraph talks about coelacanth evolution or lack thereof. So it's not paragraph five. And another way of thinking about this, if you just consider this word physiology. So this part of the word means study of. And in this, this part is a root, a Latin root, I think. Um, so phys ed is the, is the study um, of sport. Or if, if, you get a, if you need a physical, that means you need to have the doctor look at your physical body. So this is the study of phys just means body. So the study of the coelacanth body. That whole paragraph examines the physiology of a coelacanth, study of the body. All right, next, just one couple more questions. All right, nine and 10. So what are the purposes of lines 76 through 79? I'm just gonna glance at those. All right, right here. The similarity of coelacanth fins to mammalian limbs influenced scientists to initially label the coelacanth as a missing link between the evolution of land animals and fish. So I just have to determine what that statement is doing, the one that I just highlighted. Does it provide a counterclaim, describe a theory, recount an anecdote, or entertain an opinion? So an anecdote is just some amusing personal story, something that happened to you the other day, some interesting personal story. That's what an anecdote is. I, I could tell that those lines I just highlighted are not an anecdote of any kind. And it's not the counterclaim. The counterclaim comes after those lines that I just read. It's really, it's not, a, it's not an opinion. We have a term for scientific opinions. We call them theories. This was the theory. And if you want to know where the counterclaim is, the counterclaim comes after that part I just read. Here's the counterclaim. This is no longer believed to be the case, however. It does not appear that the coelacanth had, uh, sorry, ever left the ocean depths. So that's our counterclaim. But I'm not interested in the counterclaim. I'm interested in this part, which was the theory. All right, so that was B for that one, last one. So in the context of Darwin's theory, from 84 through 85, coelacanths can be viewed as what? So let's read about Darwin's theory. Charles Darwin had postulated the concept of living fossils. He believed that without the pressure to adapt, creatures could continue to exist in their ancient forms. Yeah, I mean, perhaps perhaps this fish is well suited for its environment. Its oil-filled body uh, keeps it from uh, depressurization or whatever. Maybe let's assume that there's plenty of prey or plenty of, of food, a food source 700 you know, meters below the ocean surface where these things live. So without these, without these pressures to adapt, it's already well suited for this environment. It may not change ever. So that's Darwin's theory right here. So let's go through the answer choices and let's see if we can eliminate any of these. Well, if, they, if the coelacanths are variable, answer choice A, that would mean something like this. One looks kind of like that. And another one might look like this. So perhaps they vary to a great extent, maybe in size, or maybe this one has spots. And the other one does not, no spots. So this would just mean that they vary to a large degree. But there's no indication in the passage that they vary. Like a variable in math, you can make it whatever you want. I'm gonna cross it off. Are they mutable? So this is an adjective, mutable. Just a quick question for the chat room. Uh, do either of you know what the verb would be? What's the verb of this word? The root would be the same, it's still this. Just a quick question for the chat room. I'm wondering if you know what, what we're talking about here. Just looking for the verb form 
of this adjective. If they're mutable, they do what? Paul doesn't know. Patrick, any guess? If they're mutable, let's give them a second. That means that they mutate. Yeah, no guess. Yeah, mutate. So the verb form is mutate. So do these fish frequently mutate? Or is the whole point of the passage that they do not? Yeah. So we they're not they're not highly mutable. They don't really change. Yeah. So I'm going to cross it off. We can't we can't consider them mutable because they're they're uh, ancient fossils. Is that what Darwin called them? Living fossils, whatever. They they continue to exist in their ancient form. So they're not mutable. Transitory means fleeting. This would mean that these fish are here now, then they're gone. They're they're only here for a short amount of time if they're transitory. But I know that they predate the dinosaurs. They yeah. They've been here for 360 million years, so I don't think that they are transitory. I'm gonna cross it off. They are just remnants. They are that which has remained. They continue to remain in their ancient forms. They exist in their ancient form. Okay, great. So that's a typical science passage. It's not going to be anything super complicated. It's not going to be Mendelian inheritance with wrinkly peas and smooth peas. It's going to be something basic like this. It's going to be, I mean, this kind of reads like a popular science or a scientific American, one of those types of magazine. It doesn't, it seems like a little article. It doesn't seem like I'm reading a textbook. So it's science for everybody. Let's pull up the next one, which is, I think it's a paired passage about fracking. So I'm going to load this up so you can follow along on the screen. Okay, and it's the paired passage. So for the paired passage, well, I could tell it's a paired passage because I get passage one and I get passage two by a different author. So the SAT always has one of these paired passages. Sometimes it's the history social studies one, sometimes it's the science passage. It sort of jumps around. But for the paired passage, I want to give you a strategy. And you can do this on any SAT. And the strategy is to split up the paired passages. Split up the passages. All right, so what do I mean by that? What would happen if we only read passage one? How many questions could we answer? I want to find out. Let's quickly figure out how many questions we could answer if we only read the first passage. Because you should probably just answer the first, the first passage's questions first, then go back and read the other passage. But let's just check. What if we only read passage one? How far could we make it? Could we answer this one? Yep, it's about the first passage. Could we answer 23? Yes. Could we answer 24? Yep, that's still the first passage. This is still the first passage. We can answer 25. All right, 26. We, we could skip this one for now, because this is from passage two. We could answer question 27, though. So we could really answer half of the questions before we even re have to read passage two. And I would suggest that you do always do the paired passage in this way. Always read the first one, then answer its questions. They'll always be first. They always put them right in order. So you're gonna read passage one. I want you to do it this way. Even if you've been reading both passages, 
and then answering all the questions. Try it this way, at least for this time. Just read the first passage, then answer all those questions that I check marked. Then you're going to go back, read passage two, and now you can answer question 26, and then you can answer the, all the other questions about passage two, and you can answer the questions that can compare passage two with passage one. Those always come at the end. So try, try the strategy. Split up the passages. Looks like we'll have to use this, this graph for a question or two. So that's not too bad. So read this passage, read this pair of passages about the fracking and split up the passages. Often the wrong answers will come from the other passage. But you, if you haven't even read passage two yet, you're not going to be inclined to pick those wrong answers. So try split up the passages, take some time, uh, answer the first the first passages questions, then go back, read passage two, then answer the rest of them, and just put done or finished in the chat room once you've had a chance to get all the way to question 31. So just put done or finished once you've tried them all, and I'll give you some time for, for that.
Paul's finished. We'll give Patrick some time to finish up. Okay, I think I'm going to start going over this one, just in the interest of time. Oh, you're almost done? I think Patrick's maybe on the last one or two, so maybe I'll we'll just take another minute and try to finish up. I'm not trying to rush you guys, but I, I think we might be able, to be able to do the last one. We'll see. Okay, great. All right, let's go over this passage. Hopefully you like the idea of splitting them up. I think that it's helpful. Just makes it a little bit more manageable that just answer the first passage's questions. Then I can go read, then I can answer the other passage's questions. I think it's nice to split them up. Less to keep, you know, in your internal memory bank. All right. Passage 1 focuses primarily on which 
which aspect of natural gas extraction? Number passage one seems to be the pro fracking passage. I don't really see much uh, many negatives. They, it, I think that actually the author it, uh, attempts to downplay or mitigate any 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 of the negatives of fracking and focus more on the pros. So twenty two uh, the the pro fracking passage. Passage one mainly focuses on the potential energy gains. But look at this. I, I told you that the wrong answers, the wrong answer choices often come from the other passage. It's exactly what's going on right here. The inequitable drilling locations, that's from passage two. But we haven't even read passage two at this point, so we're not going to be inclined to pick answer choice C. That was from the other passage. So the first passage mainly focuses on the amount of money that could be made, the potential energy gains. And now we have to find the evidence. Where is the evidence? It's right here, lines 14 through 16 from the first passage. As a result of this technique, shale gas production in the U.S. has increased from 1 to 4.8 trillion cubic feet between 2006 and 2010. So that's a huge increase, it really is. So, the and yeah, this is sort of the pro-fracking passage, the first one. So there was our evidence. All right, passage three, or sorry, paragraph three of passage one attempts to dispel what fears regarding shale gas extraction. I'm just gonna look at the third paragraph. Let's see here, one, two, Paragraph three. So this is what paragraph three is about. Let me read the first sentence. Despite the concerns of some, no evidence has been recorded of fracturing fluid migrating to underground aquifers. Okay, that would be bad. That would be bad for the environment. And the question that the, the answer choice that deals with the environmental concerns, the ecological concern. So, not too hard so far. 24 BC, that whole paragraph attempts to mitigate or downplay the ecological concerns. The, the author just says, okay, well, these chemicals have not entered the water table. No evidence. Uh, there's no evidence that the fracking fluid has entered the water table. So those, that, was, uh, that would be an ecological concern. 25, how does the EPA revision strengthen the claims of passage 1? Now I know that natural gas emissions are decreasing from my graph, but that's not what the EPA revision is about. I know that based on my graph, as shale gas production goes up, Methane emissions have gone down over time. So I, I know that, that's what my graph shows me. But that's the graph, not the EPA revision. So I'm gonna cross off A. I'm looking for the part about the EPA revision. Does the passage ever claim that natural gas is a clean energy source? That's going too far. We know it's not a clean energy source, even though it's better than coal. The passage does mention that natural gas emissions are lower than that of coal, but that's not what the EPA revision was about. We have to find the part about the EPA revision. So I'm going to look for it right in passage one. Where was the EPA revision? It's right here. Recently, the EPA has released new methane emissions uh, estimates that are 20% lower than had previously been thought. That's the EPA revision. Would you consider 20% to be rigorously overestimated? I would. 20% is huge. So if they overestimated methane emissions by 20%, I would call that rigorous. I think 20% counts as rigorous. That's huge. All right, so on to the 26. That was the EPA revision. Oh wait, let's skip this one for now because we're still on passage one. Let's do this one first. Uh, let's do 27 first and then we'll go back. All right, as used in line 26, what does viable mean? To 
Just looking at line 26 from the passage. Here we go. Though not perfect, shale gas promises to be a viable bridge to more environmentally sustainable forms of energy production. So I could read the words back in the sentence. Let's try it. I'm going to try variable. Though not perfect, shale gas promises to be a variable bridge to more environmentally sustainable forms of energy production. That makes no sense. I'm going to cross that off. That's gibberish. A is out. I don't even think I'm going to try to read answer choice B. Past tense analyzed in there. That would be insane. Let's try feasible. Uh, though not perfect, shale gas promises to be a feasible bridge to more environmentally sustainable forms of energy production. Yeah, that, that fits perfectly. So if I think your plan is viable, I think your plan is fe feasible, it's the same thing. I think it could work. It could be a viable bridge or a feasible bridge. So that has the same meaning right there. All right, now we're going to go back and read passage two. We can go back, blah, 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 blah. We're going to read this one by Matthew Ferenc. Now I can go back to where I was. I left right off with this one that we just skipped a minute ago. Now we're going to go back and actually do it. Hopefully you like splitting up the passages. I find it to be very helpful. So it's another vocab question. What does the word poised mean in the context of line 72? Let's read the line. 72. All right, right here. Sometimes things go wrong with the drilling, and there has been no shortage of attention to wells gone bad and streams that can be set on fire and the clandestine ways of an industry poised to make a ton of money on a ton of gas. So I'm going to read the words back in the sentence. Let's start with balanced. Okay, sometimes things go wrong, streams can be set on fire. There's no shortage of attention to, uh, yeah, okay. Sometimes things go wrong with the drilling and there's been no shortage of attention to wells gone bad and streams that can be set on fire and the clandestine, the sneaky ways of an industry balanced to make a ton of money on a ton of gas. And I don't think that the word balanced quite fits here. And they like to pick words that almost make sense. I've just been calling them near words. It's a W. Or you could call them almost words. Words that would almost fit, but there's a better word. Let me try positioned. Watch out for near words on the SAT or almost words. Let me try the word position. See if this fits any better. All right, sometimes things go wrong and there's been no shortage of attention to walls gone bad and streams that can be set on fire and the clandestine ways of an industry poised to make a ton of money on a ton of gas. And that fits perfectly. That is the correct word. That's the best answer choice right there. So balanced got us close. That's our near word. That's our trap word. Positioned fits so much better. All right, on to 28. Both passages uh, draw attention to which aspect of shale gas extraction. They both mention the potential for accidents. The first passage attempts to downplay the potential for accidents. And the second passage, well, I just read, I just read an accident that could happen. Streams can be set on fire. So that sounds bad. Uh, streams can be set on fire. So both, both passages mentioned the potential for accidents. The first one attempts to downplay them. The second passage has its own unique voice on the situation. So that one was B. 29. The author of passage 2 would most likely say what about this part from passage 1? So I'm going to read part of passage 1. 29 through 31 from passage 1, and then I just have to figure out what Matthew Ferenc would say about it. He's our second author. So I'm just going to read some lines. I'm reading 29 through 31 right here. Okay. 
Fears over leaked methane gas, as well as contamination from hydraulic fracturing fluid, have led to a moratorium on the, pro on the process in some areas. Well, what's a moratorium? We probably need to know what that is before we can even answer this question. And a moratorium is just a ban. So, contamination from hydraulic fracturing fluid has led to a ban on the process in some areas. All right, so what would our second author, what would this guy, Matthew Ferenc, say about the fact that this process is banned in some areas? Let's find out. Let's look at the answer choices. Would Matthew say that public outcry will lead to greater restrictions on hydraulic fracturing? I don't think that that is his voice. He, he has a particular voice in this passage, and that I'm not hearing it. Would he say that the deleterious effects of hydraulic fracturing can be assuaged by greater regulation? The harmful effects can be mitigated, can be reduced by greater regulation? I don't think he would say that either. Would he say that provisional uh, bans need to remain until more is known about the effects of hydraulic fracturing. That's not what his argument is. What he does mention is something like answer choice D. Bans on hydraulic fracturing occur in more affluent areas. That's a dollar sign. So wealthy areas. That's exactly what Matthew Ferenc would say about the idea that fracking is banned in wealthy areas. Let me find some evidence because we're going to need it for this next question. Where is the evidence? Let's look in lines 74 through 75. Here we go. Here's some evidence. I think about how the spoiling of lives happens so often in places considered second rate, like Appalachia. That our mountains are fracked is certainly related to the kind of cultural power we don't carry. We never quite catch a break in the national circulation of stereotypes. Hillbillies, we are called misfits of the mountains. So that's some good evidence uh, to the fact that this this process would not is not likely to be banned in Appalachia. It'll be banned in, in Mount Lebanon or be banned in Upper St. Clair. It's not going to be banned. Um, and a place that people consider to be second rate. So that was our evidence. 31. The passage and the graph would support which of the following statements? Well, we know that the EPA overestimated methane emissions by 20%. So it's definitely either A or C. Now we have to use the graph. And I said that, yeah, as shale gas production has gone up over time, methane emissions have gone down. So that one is just answer choice A. The EPA overestimated methane emissions by 20% and total emissions have declined based on the graph. Okay, so I don't think we're gonna have time to go through the next science passage which is about dolphins. I'm just going to give you the answer so that you could try it at home if you want and check your work. So maybe write these, jot these down on the front of your packet, somewhere where you're not going to be inclined to look at them and, and cheat. I know you guys don't cheat, but put, maybe put these on the front of your packet so you won't look at the answers while you're trying it. I'm just going to jot these down and then sign us off for, for, for the evening pretty much. Yeah, it's kind of an interesting passage. You should, you should read it if you get a chance. It's by Jacques Cousteau. So it's kind of interesting. It talks about dolphins. Give you some answers in case you want to try this at home. But we are running out of time, so I'm not going to keep you guys late. All right.
Maybe I should label what this is dolphins. All right, so those are the answer, the correct answer choices for this dolphin passage. So once you have these jotted down, you can just sign yourself off, uh, Patrick and Paul. And thanks for sticking around and being so awesome. Thanks for all your hard work. Uh, yeah, so we are still grading pack practice tests. Paul, we'll grade your test. I know it's on the way, so thanks. And Patrick, if you want to, please send us in one because you need you need some practice. So. Have a great night and we'll see you all next time. That's all I have. So have a great have a great night. Have a great week.